I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. Later, we'll summarize who's in the running for casino licenses in New York. But first, Congressman George Santos confessed that he lied in embellishing his resume while running for office. So how has he managed to remain in office? Joining us on Zoom, Nicholas Fandos, Metro political reporter for The Times, who has dug deeply into the politician's fabricated history. Nick, uh, it seems that uh, a little bit did come out before the election about George Santos. There was a story in the uh, North Shore Leader, the small Republican, uh, small paper on Long Island, and some Republican consultants seemed to have known what was going on. And as you reported, before he ran the first time in 2020, he filled out a questionnaire that uh, in which he had to list some of his qualifications and credentials. So how come nobody blew the whistle before the election? Well, I think that that is one of the most important questions that this whole strange story of Jan George Santos raises, Sam. And, and I think if you think about American politics as having a kind of informal gatekeeping system that we as voters rely on um, the party of the candidate who's running, kind of party leaders, uh, the opposing party and the media to basically scrub and check out and vet and try and suss out you know, lies from the truth and and who the candidates really are that uh, that voters are choosing between. Um, there were failures at every gate in that process, I think, with George Santos. So local Republican leaders uh, ostensibly vetted him back in 2020, as you say, but their vet just basically involved George Santos telling them uh, a series of answers to their questions and then taking his word for it and, and thinking nothing else of it. Um, Santos's own campaign uh, found out certain things about them, didn't disclose them. Democrats failed to turn up uh, evidence of, of many of his misdeeds, so they had some. And the media uh, outside of the North Shore leader, and, and we can talk about this, um, you know, did not really dig into George Santos's past until after he was a congressman-elect. And most of the uh, stories, many of them broken by the New York Times, uh, as you say, did come after the election. Republican consultants knew what was going on, at least they suspected what was going on. How come that information didn't get to uh, the Republican Party itself, or did it? So the most glaring example of this that uh, I have reported in The Times is that Santos's own campaign, Santos himself commissioned what is known as a vulnerability study. Um, this is something that's pretty typical for a candidate to do, pay some researchers to scrub up everything they can find on you so you know, what, what are my opponents going to attack me on later on? Well, that report that came back to his campaign in late uh, 2021, December of 2021, um, found many of the fabrications that would come out a year later uh, and showed a pretty alarming pattern of mistruths and deceptions um, so much so that folks working for his campaign urged him to drop out. They said, if you don't, this is going to come out. You're going to be humiliated. But he refused, and they walked away and quit. And they all had signed uh, non-disclosure agreements, which mm -hmm. meant what belonged to Santos, and their hands were tied in some ways. Now, that being said, there were uh, a, you know information uh, around that study, its existence, and then individual instances where Republican politicians caught him in a lie or felt his story didn't add up, that kind of percolated through the party, including in the upper echelons uh, of, you know, House Republican leadership. The main House super PAC was suspicious of him and actually did not invest in this race. They all insist now that they didn't know the complete mm -hmm. picture of George Santos's lies, but they had enough to know something here doesn't add up. Um, and I think many of them assumed either he wasn't going to win or in our you know, adversarial process, the Democrats will do opposition research on him and they'll turn up many of these same things uh, and end up destroying him before he ever makes it to office. That's obviously not how it turned out. Nicholas, given the broad scope of the lies that uh, Congressman Santos told and the fact that some revelations are still coming out in The Times and elsewhere, was he more cocky than cunning about his resume? I think that that's uh, probably a, a good way to put it. I mean, in this age of, uh, you know, long digital footprints and ubiquitous social media, it's hard to cover this stuff up uh, forever. And some of these lies are really, frankly, pretty audacious, um, you know, claiming that his mother died because of complications, uh, you know, on 9-11, when, in fact, you know, we had fresh reporting yesterday that she was in Brazil during 9-11. 
Um, you know, something here, you know, whether it was design or this all got out of hand, you know, uh, leave it to the psychologists and, and the courts to figure out later on uh, if it gets to that point. But, um, you know, I, I did just want to say something about about why an additional reason I think these lies weren't detected during the campaign. You know, even on his face, if you accepted George Santos as a wealthy, you know, financier, uh, as he presented himself, uh, he had pretty um, far right uh, and out of the mainstream views on two of the most important issues in this election cycle, and that was abortion rights and January 6th. He was claims to have been at the Capitol ellipse ahead of January 6th. He claims to have paid to help rioters get out of jail, um, and he compared abortion uh, to, to slavery and called it an abomination. Now, running in a suburban, moderate swing district in, outside of New York City, um, I think Democrats assumed those issues enough were incredibly potent, better ammo, frankly, than they had against Republicans in other districts. And so that's where they spent most of their time. And frankly, I think that's where the media uh, spent a lot of its time when writing about this race as well. Nicholas, uh, we're talking uh, before the weekend, and of course, we always may be overtaken by events. Uh, but where does this wind up as far as we can best tell? Is it OK to lie as a politician or is there some time where you cross a line legally? Yeah, well, I think the, the verdict is still out on that in the political system. And we're waiting to see what happens with the legal system. So Santos has made clear he is going not going to resign despite um, local Republicans, almost every Republican on Long Island calling for him to. Um, House Republican leadership has made sure that made clear they're not going to force him out right now. They've said he's going to have to earn the trust of his colleagues. But, you know, remember, there's a very narrow majority for Republicans in the House right now. They don't want to lose a vote, have a special election um, that they could end up losing. And so if, if that holds, I think that the big question is what happens in the legal system. Uh, we have reported and others have as well that Santos is uh, being pursued by both local or local state and federal prosecutors right now who are looking to see if he broke any laws. There's all kinds of irregularities in his campaign finance reports and um, in some of his business dealings. Uh, so, you know, we will see if any of those turn out to be, um, you know, enough to support criminal charges. Uh, but I think that that probably is, is the next uh, phase of this story. A fascinating story, and we will keep following your byline in the New York Times. Uh, Nicholas Fandos, thank you for joining us. Coming up next, casinos eventually in New York City. Welcome back. The lifting of a ban on casino licenses has some very big players lined up to see if they can luck out and be awarded one of the licenses. The price tag, a hefty $500 million to start. That means the field has narrowed considerably since the announcement last spring. Stephanos Chen, a Metro reporter who's been following the story and joins us now. Stephanos, what is the process from here on in? We've got a couple of candidates, a couple of sites potentially. What happens from here? Well, basically now we have this process in which uh, the bidding began this month. Uh, essentially, the, the request for applications went out. But that is just the beginning of a very long tail process in which uh, that commission is basically saying the earliest is going to be end of 2023 in which we'll get a decision. Mm -hmm. They've now taken that off their website and there's no mention of that. So now it, it seems as though they're expecting it to go longer than that. Um, but what's really happening is that you have all of these new players in New York City and the region who are now going to bid, uh, essentially start their charm offensive with the public, really, mm -hmm. because a big part of this process is getting the community on board. Uh, each of these bids has to pass a six-person committee, which has representatives from the mayor, the governor, and local officials, uh, city council, state, uh, state uh, uh, senate, and assembly members. Uh, and, and basically, you, you need a majority of those representatives to, to greenlight this project before it can be considered by the commission. What's in it for the communities? I mean, casinos promise a lot. Uh, they have promised a lot historically, and a lot of them have not been able to deliver around the country on that promise. Why would a community say, OK, you know, we'll take a casino? Well, historically, it's interesting. Uh, when, when this, the idea of casinos first in New York State happened, it was around uh, it was 2013, in which we were just getting over the recession, and there was sort of this climate of we need economic resurgence. Mm -hmm. uh, this second stage for, for downstate, New York City and the area, is happening in this pandemic moment, wherein the same reasoning is happening, and uh, folks may be more 
inclined to believe that the city needs something like this. Uh, so these, these bidders are basically going to lean into this hard. And uh, rather than the casino, they're putting all these amenities and benefits in front uh, to sort of get the public on their side. Like what? What would persuade me as a neighbor or a member of the community to say, oh, I really want this place? Well, number one is they won't mention the casinos until 10 minutes into the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them, the two... The like calling it gaming instead of gambling. Well, the, yes, the euphemism gaming is now everywhere, which is one thing. And then, uh, you know, the, I think the, the bidders, two of the bidders uh, mentioned specifically that t less than 10% of their entire project will be gambling. In terms of physical space? or In terms of square footage of mm -hmm. their site. And, and these all vary wildly. I mean, some of these we're looking at in, in Manhattan, for instance, the developer of Hudson Yards, related companies, wants to turn the entire western half of their site into this large convention center slash entertainment slash casino area. And that we're talking about at least 10 acres over there, mm -hmm. uh, which can vary uh, a lot compared to, if you go to the other side of Manhattan, Saks Fifth Avenue, the department store, wants to convert the top three floors of its building uh, across the street from St. Patrick's uh, into uh, a very high, uh, high end, you know, luxury uh, casino, kind of like a Monte Carlo type deal, mm. um, which would be much smaller, a couple hundred thousand square feet. So how many sites are actually in contention at this point? You say, you know, they're likely to, we're talking about the whole region here to be in the selection process. Uh, how many sites are, are really up for grabs? As of last count, the series bidders, there are nine. Uh, so we have... Uh, currently four in Manhattan, uh, you have two in Queens, um, and we can go through some of these. There's one in, in South Brooklyn and Coney Island. Uh, it, it, and um, you know, there are two that are likely to, to go far, if not get two of these three available licenses, uh, which are called uh, Eracinos. Essentially, mm -hmm. they're called that because Vegas-style casinos have not been allowed in New York City, but there uh, has been uh, some form of gambling allowed at these uh, racetracks. If you think of the Aqueduct in Queens or in Yonkers, mm -hmm. it's another uh, where you know you can do digital gaming, but there's no table games, there's no live uh, dealers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you pointed out that uh, in Queens at Aqueduct, that is one of the most profitable places in the country. It is outside of Vegas. It, it is uh, one of, if not the most uh, profitable, uh, you know, casinos doing the most business anyway. Uh, so you know, there, there's certainly. Uh, uh, these bidders are looking at that and looking at this untapped market in, in uh, you know, a greater New York area that has over 20 million uh, people, uh, many of whom would be, I'm sure, curious at least uh, about these uh, endeavors. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of money at stake, and, and these developers all uh, are jumping on it as early as they can. Given the number of bidders, given the number of available sites, is it likely that there will be one casino in Manhattan, at least one? Well, it's going to come down to community opposition or community support, rather. Um, it, it, it seems er, early days still, but but there is certainly a lot of folks uh, who are opposed. You have uh, a lot of electeds who are skeptical, uh, and I think that is a reflection of their constituents being skeptical, uh, which again goes back to this you know tail wagging the dog issue of like it's not a casino, it is an entertainment complex, mm -hmm. or it is a, a job driver. A lot of these bids have uh, promises of housing, for instance, wh whether they'll be able to put affordable housing towers near this. In Hudson Yards, they're talking about a school, uh, affordable housing, green space. A school uh, for croupiers. Uh, no. <laughs> well, a, a school was promised in the initial uh, plans for the western uh, um, half of that site, for instance. Uh, but now you'll have electeds who are looking at this kind of askew and saying, well, do we really want a new school so close to a gambling facility? Mm. Um, so there's going to be a lot of maneuvering. There's going to be a lot of land use issues that will come up as well for these sites as, as to whether some of these have the right to, to build where they want to build. A lot of money going into this, as you pointed out in stories in the Times, a lot of lobbying money, probably a lot of campaign contributions too. Do we have any sense as to where that money is actually spent? We know where it's coming from. Where is it going? A lot of this lobbyist money, you know, has, has gone to political campaigns in the past. Uh, Mayor Eric Adams in the past, when he was a state senator, was, was involved in, in, in gaming. Uh, he, um, he, one of his uh, recent uh, uh, past now, uh, hires uh, worked at one of these racinos. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's uh, many connections. Uh, former Governor Patterson is an executive at one of the companies, Las Vegas Sands, that mm -hmm. is bidding in Nassau County at the uh, Nassau Coliseum site. Uh, so there is politics a across the spectrum here, and each each of these bidders has some um, some access in, in the sense of of, uh, of Albany. I'm sure they do. Uh, each claiming uh, their own lobbyists, their own uh, special senators and 
assemblymen and the like. Stephanos Chen of the New York Times, thank you so much for joining us with that update. And coming up next, 52 places in the world to visit. Welcome back. The annual 52 Places to Go, recently published at nytimes.com and the New York Times travel section, takeaways that mean the travel is almost back to pre-pandemic normal. Joining us now, senior editor Stephen Hiltner of the New York Times travel section, who has written about these 52 places. Stephen, how did you pick them? That's a good question. We rely on our contributors to send us recommendations. And so I think at the end of September, we sent an email out to basically everybody that contributes to the travel section, foreign correspondents, foreign bureau chiefs. We also have a ton of freelancers, photographers, and reporters all over the world. So we send out this big call out. We say we're putting together our annual list. Send us your recommendations for places to go in 2023. And you know we end up with something like three, 400 recommendations. And then uh, on the travel desk, there's a handful of editors. We basically get into a conference room and spend many, many weeks whittling the, that large list down to 52. Well, sitting in a conference room on the west side of Manhattan, how do you pick which of the ones that people would really want to go to, yourself included? I think ultimately we're looking for an element of timeliness. We mm -hmm. want to have a reason to recommend these places in 2023 in particular. And so that drives a lot of the conversation. Um, I think London at the top of the list is probably the best example of that. We have the coronation of King Charles III in May. And so we've sort of chosen that as a place where you, you go there, you don't just learn about history, but you sort of witness in history and participate in history mm. in a way. And so it's a very timely place to go in 2023. How many of the places have you been able to visit yourself, either since or before the list came out? Uh, you know, I never, I didn't sit down and count this year, but I think it's probably around 10. 10 really? 12. That's pretty good out pretty of 52. Good. Yeah. Uh, the closest, I think, was New Haven. Yes. And then I think there are two sites in Charleston, if I'm remember uh, two right. sites in South Carolina one in South Carolina uh, yes one is Charleston itself and I think the other is uh, uh, Greenville South Carolina which has a really sort of blossoming food scene mm -hmm. uh, but Charleston is, is interesting they have a new museum opening up this year a hundred million dollar international African-American museum mm -hmm. um, that's sort of dedicated to sort of unpacking the complicated history there with the tra transatlantic slave trade when you look at these 52 and the visuals particularly in nytimes.com online or just stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, any that you say, my God, that's on my bucket list, I gotta get there? I think the one that really caught me, well, there, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two. One is in the United States, um, Monument Valley Navajo Tribal Park, mm. which is this stunning, beautiful site on the border between Arizona and Utah with these really sort of cinematic sandstone um, towers. Um, so I've never been uh, there. I've been to that part of the country, but not to that particular park. And then I think internationally, there's a site in uh, Mathana, Greece, which is a volcanic peninsula, maybe 30 miles as the crow flies southwest of Athens. Mm -hmm. And that is a place where locals have essentially mapped ancient walking paths. Oh, wow. And created these new hiking trails and running trails. And you can, you can walk along these paths knowing that uh, 5,000 years ago, other people have sort of traversed the same areas. Okay, I don't think I've been to any of them, but just looking at the, uh, the pictures and the text online, I have to say Kangaroo Island and that Scottish castle are definitely on my list. What's the impact of our listing these places? Uh, do they get overwhelmed with tourists? I mean, did, did these become sort of a self-defeating process? Once we put them out there, they, you know, become uh, different forms of what the ideal that we visualize, visualize them as? Yeah, I don't think we have quite that power, but we are very careful in choosing the list not to recommend places that we feel are sort of in danger of being overrun. I think over-tourism is a real problem in the travel industry, and we have certainly covered it. We've written quite a bit about it um, on the travel desk and outside the travel desk of the Times. I think there was a really interesting story recently about um, the way that remote workers in a very short time period have really transformed certain neighborhoods in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very aware of that, we're very conscious of it. And that. was that because of something we had written before? Or? No, th 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 that was essentially because, you know, remote, remote work is available to many more people now mm. and more companies are allowing it. And so people are sort of traveling to new places and setting up shop. And um, obviously some people coming in with quite a bit of money and sort of really transforming places very quickly. So that is a phenomenon that we've seen elsewhere in the world for other reasons. 
um, for many years now, and it's something we're all sort of very conscious of. I noticed a lot of reader comments uh, online in response to the uh, 52 places. Uh, have they carried through with any kind of thread? Have people said, my God, I'm so amazed, or I never thought of these before? Or... Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people look at this list. I mean, I, I think that readers fall into sort of one of two categories, generally speaking. There are the people who look at this list and who say, okay, in March, I'm going to go there, and in June, I'm going to go there, and in September, I'm going to go there. I think there is a much broader category, far more people who look at this list just as a way of sitting quietly for an hour or two. And living vicariously. Their, yeah, right, right. So they're maybe trying to hide their browser window from their boss, and they're sort of sitting there really daydreaming of these places. I think that is probably the, the, the biggest service, in my opinion, that the list provides. It provides people a chance to sort of learn about new places, to see beautiful pictures of new places, um, to sort of, yeah, travel, travel vicariously, um, and to see what else is out there in the world. I think so many of us have been locked up that just seeing mm. these places and learning about them on a screen can be very moving and very powerful. Sure, it's better than not being there at all, for right. sure. Stephen, uh, how close to normal uh, have we come back uh, to pre-pandemic levels in terms of travel, mm -hmm. and also in terms of people's uh, desire to go traveling around? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult question. I think the latest estimates that I saw um, suggested that in 2023, the travel and tour tourism industry will be something at 80% of mm. pre-pandemic levels, which is quite high. I think that number may change uh, fairly dramatically because in recent weeks, China has sort of relaxed its mm -hmm. travel and tourism policies. And, the, uh, and there's been sort of a shortage of uh, tourists coming from China for the most part over the past few years. Absolutely. I think in 2019, um, Chinese tourists spent something like $250 billion mm -hmm. outside of their country. So they are a huge segment um, of, the, of the tourism industry now. And they sort of, in particular, really affect the, the local travel markets. Um, so that may change things and push that number even higher. Um, but I think we're getting close to being back. Obviously, this list is not meant as a recommendation that people sort of hop on a plane and travel internationally. I think there are qu still quite a few risks and, and a lot of compelling reasons not to be traveling now. Mm. But I think it's up to individual readers to sort of assess those risks and, and make that choice for themselves. A big surprise uh, that London was on our list, at least a big surprise to some British newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were, I guess, pleasantly surprised, if a little bit snarky about it. <laughs> yeah, I did see that. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about the, the media landscape there to really speak about it. But um, it certainly, I was in London um, in August of this past year and had a wonderful time there. I think obviously the city is going through a huge transition. It's, it's a, 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 certainly an exciting place to be in May with the coronation, but um, a beautiful city and a wonderful city to explore even outside of that. Very quickly, what's your next destination, do you think? Um, that is a good question. I'm not quite sure. I tend to be quite a last minute travel planner. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the pandemic has shifted that even later. Um, I'm sort of sort of loath to make my plans too early these days, but I, have, I haven't quite decided yet. Okay, keep us posted. Stephen Hiltner, The New York Times, thank you for joining us. And next, my thoughts on choosing a chief judge. We rarely quote former New York state legislators on matters of political principle, but the Senate Judiciary Committee's decision this week to reject the nomination of Hector LaSalle as chief judge merits an exception. After all, the vote marked the first time that New York lawmakers rebuffed a governor's choice to head the state's highest court and to oversee the judicial system. The liberal Democratic legislators who nixed the nomination did not question the judge's professional credentials or his qualifications. Rather, they seized upon what they considered to be his conservative bent on labor unions, women's rights, and other issues. What's more, they flatly declared their opposition even before the judge had the opportunity to defend his positions during a hearing on Wednesday. Writing in the Law Journal this week, former Chief Judge Saul Wachtler invoked the advice of a founding father, Alexander Hamilton, who happened to have served in the New York State Assembly. Hamilton was wise to the ways legislators make up their minds even then. He opposed entrusting legislative bodies to stack the judiciary to one bent or another. He warned that the process would, quote, display all the private and party likings and dislikes, partialities and antipathies, attachments and animosities 
that the lawmakers harbored. The founders left the choice to the executive, but reluctantly vested the Senate with a veto. The Senate could not be tempted by the preference they might feel to another to reject the one proposed, Hamilton predicted, because they could not assure themselves that the person they might wish would be brought forward by any subsequent nomination would be more acceptable. The whole point of amending the state constitution to provide for merit selection by the governor was to rid the process of politics. Wachtler was a Republican, chosen by a Democratic governor. The vote this week left Governor Hochul facing two politically fraught alternatives. Legally, to try to force the full Senate to vote on Justice LaSalle's nomination or withdraw a nomination that she had taken for granted. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.